the um, screen share. All right, what you see before you are my uh, lecture notes. Some people have uh, found that this uh, helps them as they go back and look at the, um, at the recording to kind of keep place and also have something there that they can uh, take notes from and refer to. And somehow it, uh, I think people find it makes it easier for them then to go back and see um, the particular place and the aspect of the lecture where the questions occur. That is the questions for the exam. Now, let me say at the beginning, some people have, um, I, I don't know if they've misunderstood um, or whether they're just concerned, uh, but attendance at these lectures is not required. Uh, that's one aspect of the web-based uh, learning that the college uh, provides. But uh, being acquainted with these lectures is required. And that's the reason that I place them on the YouTube channel so that you can go back. If you can't attend, you can go back and see um, uh, what everyone else sees, even though you can't attend. If you can attend, that's great, uh, but it's not required. Now, if you watch this and you have a question about what we've talked about, then please uh, give me a personal email and um, I'll answer it if I can. If I can't uh, satisfy your question via email, then we will set up a Zoom meeting just between us. And that's available to anyone basically at any time. If you find yourself uh, worried or lost or both, uh, please uh, send me uh, an invitation uh, or a request for a um, for a Zoom meeting, we'll organize that at, at our uh, mutual um, convenience. So I don't want anyone to be uh, to feel like they're out of place or they don't know what's uh, going on. So uh, that's kind of where things are. So please don't uh, think that you have to be uh, attending. We don't take attendance with the um, with the web-based learning, but we do require that you know uh, the material. So that's the reason the, all of the lectures get uh, recorded. All right, this is Philosophy 240. It is uh, roughly entitled Introduction to Ethics. Uh, let me say at the beginning that even though we will continue to refer to what we do as ethics, that is really a misnomer. Uh, ethics is more properly moral theory. And that is a philosophical uh, question and a philosophical um, aspect. And we'll talk about the different um, forms of philosophy uh, as we go on into this first part of the course. Now, right now, as I've said before, you do not uh, need, have to start um, in the textbook. That's going to be two weeks into the course or so, depending on how far we get um, in these introductory um, lectures. Uh, when we do start with the text, we won't actually start with chapter one. You know, on the e-text, there is a preliminary um, uh, introduction, I guess we might say, that is entitled uh, Philosophy, um, I forget what it's called now, but it's right at the beginning of your e-text. In the physical text, it's the appendix. Uh, so if you have the uh, physical textbook, it is at the end of that uh, physical textbook. It's at the beginning of the, um, 
of the e-text, and that is how to write a paper, how to cite sources, and those things. That's really extraordinarily important. So if you have the physical text, please, bef um, the first assignment in the text is not actually the text itself, but the uh, sort of how to do philosophy uh, uh, part of the text. So it's at the beginning of the e-text at the end of the physical text. So that's the first assignment. So if you want to get started in the textbook, that's where you start. And then about uh, two weeks from now, we will begin with chapter one. What our consideration is for these first few days and weeks um, of the course is what is philosophy? Uh, philosophy began with uh, the Greeks. It's a, it's a roughly sixth century um, invention of uh, the Greeks. Uh, to put this into context, if you remember, you, I, maybe in high school, I don't know, I in high school I had to read uh, some Greek plays, um, and uh, everyone is familiar with the Iliad and the Odyssey, I hope. Uh, that is roughly um, seventh century. Uh, Homer is uh, seventh century. The, the Greek poets uh, too. Uh, the greatest of uh, which was probably uh, Sappho, uh, a female um, poet, famous uh, Greek, perhaps the best uh, Greek poets, uh, Sappho from the island of uh, Lesbos. Um, her love poetry is um, some of the greatest in world literature. And uh, as you might guess, uh, Sappho being from Lesbos uh, was um, uh, not the first lesbian, but at least um, uh, one of the most famous one of the earliest literary. So she is around seventh century, uh, Homer uh, and the other Greek poets are roughly at the same time. To put this into some kind of perspective that you might be familiar with, uh, King David in the Old Testament is uh, roughly uh, the ninth century. So these are, um, um, that's to give you some idea of the time frame that uh, philosophy and Greek poetry uh, begins roughly a uh, couple of hundred years after, uh, after King David and the Hebrew uh, prophets. Now, uh, for our purposes, historically, to place this into some kind of perspective, humans have always understood that there were basically three ways of gaining knowledge. Uh, those three ways were through religion, uh, philosophy and science. And by the way, the, the, Greek, uh, the Greeks invented uh, science. Well, I don't know if they invented it, but they certainly invented the parameters that we now call uh, science. The keys for religion and the way religion knows is through faith. Now, this not only is historically the case, but in many ways, it still is the paradigm for how we develop uh, knowledge in our own time. There is no science that does not begin with some kind of faith in an hypothesis. You, this has to be generated literally through faith. The greatest scientists in many ways still perpetuate this model uh, a theory begins with a basic understanding, a basic trial, and that comes through act, faith. You have faith that you are right, and then you, in science, set out to prove that you are right. So historically, it's true. Experientially, it is true. So religion begins with faith and the key for religion, the key word for religion is faith. Philosophy is a step above that. Philosophy begins the analysis that tests those hypotheses that begin with faith. So faith, uh, philosophy is an intermediary, shall we say, 
between religion and science, the key word in science is fact. Uh, just the facts, man. That's the key provision of science. So the key word for religion, faith, the key word for philosophy, analysis, the key word for science, fact. So we're going to start with the very first philosopher, Thales of Miletus. Miletus is one of the Greek provinces. Uh, Thales was the very first philosopher. For Thales, um, the key to everything is water. And we might imagine that, that water is called an element, by the way, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. The, the earliest uh, pre-Socratics look for the essential element. What is the bedrock, the foundation of everything? Now, Thales proposed water. And we might understand that because we can go for days upon days without food, but not very long without water. Even in modern biology, water is sort of the uh, progenitor, shall we say, of life itself. So uh, even modern biology picks up on this fundamental, very fundamental observation uh, by Thales that water is the sort of basis of the soup of life, shall we th say. Uh, one of the most famous uh, quotations from Thales is, everything is full of gods. Everything can bring forth something. Uh, Anaximenes, one of the early, uh, other early pre-Socratics said that air is the really real. And, oh, that's true. I mean, how long can you survive without breathing? So you could see why uh, Anaximenes would say, oh, but Thales, you know, what, uh, air is even more important than water. Famous quotation from Anaximenes is, air is the really real permutations, he says, everything results from condensation and rarefication. Heraclitus, one of my uh, favorites, um, said that fire is the really real. Fire destroys everything. Uh, for Heraclitus, everything was in change. Everything was in flux. There was no such thing as uh, stability. Well, one of the most famous quotes from Heraclitus is, you can't step into the same river twice. Now think about that. Uh, you put your foot in uh, the creek or the river and immediately you put your foot in again. Well, the part of the river that you put your foot into has already gone downstream. Interesting thought here by Heraclitus. Reality is constant change. The two great thinkers who formed modern philosophy really, I think, are Heraclitus, who said that there's no such thing as stability. And Parmenides, his major opponent, who said there's no such thing as change. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Xenophanes said that Earth is the really real. Uh, one, one of the great things about Xenophanes is that he uh, protested against uh, theological anthropomorphisms. Uh, you remember now, do you not, that uh, the Greek gods were basically hyped up uh, humans. They were seen as, uh, as extremely powerful humans, but in essence, not that very different from a human. One of the great quotes of um, Xenophanes is that if uh, if asses and cows uh, had gods, they would look like asses and cows. 
So those are just examples of four examples of um, the first uh, pre-Socratics. Well, they, they were the pre-Socratics. And we still to this day have talk of earth, air, fire, and water. Primitive uh, people in the Middle Ages and uh, even um, into current times talk about the, the sort of essences of the world as earth, air, fire, and water. These people invented that, that uh, basic understanding. We call them pre-Socratics. Uh, their term for themselves and Aristotle's term for them was physiologoi. Physio, we get our word physics from that, uh, meaning the physical. Uh, logoi comes from the study of. Uh, today we have psychology, right? Uh, we have biology. Those pull from those, those Greek words. Still, we use those Greek words. They live with us today. Physio meaning physical, logos meaning the study of the structure of something. They were physiologoi. Maybe the better term for them would be physicist. Uh, they, they look at the world purely in terms of physics. We are going to discuss uh, philosophy as four or five different distinct disciplines. But for these early guys, um, they were basically interested in the questions, uh, what we would call today the questions of uh, physics. Now they had four elements, the earth, uh, air, fire, and water. There are 118 elements today in the basic table of periodic elements. Um, organoson is the latest that was added to the periodic table of the elements and that was added in 2016. So we we continue adding these basic building block structures. Um, We've gone from four to 118. Um, even the pre-Socratics, one of them was named uh, Democritus Lucretius. Um, he defined the term element that's still basically with us today. He said that elements are chemically the simplest substances and hence cannot be broken down using chemical reactions. As we said before, it begins with the pre-Socratics, earth, air, fire, and water, and today we're down to element uh, 118, organoson. Uh, we still organize the building blocks of reality the way the pre-Socratics originated them. We still look for the very essence, the things that can make up and build up the structure of reality, and that's what the periodic table of the elements tells us. It's a difference of kind and not degree. We still think like these early pre-Socratics told us. So it is not, it is simply a development of quantity. We simply added to what they originally thought and told us. We've not changed it. We've not changed the structure of reality. We've simply added to it. So these cats are still with us behind the scene of what we do today, a difference of kind and not degree. All right, let's step it up just a little bit. Parmenides is a little later than the rest of these folks that we've talked about. Um, one of the great statements of um, Parmenides, Parmenides, by the way, is from Elia, uh, Thales was from Miletus, um, and the Eleatics uh, began a total tradition in philosophy that wasn't resolved until Plato, really. But the famous quote from Parmenides is, what is, is, what is not, is not. 
So the great German philosopher Hegel said that it was literally Parmenides that began philosophy proper. Because he's looking for the changeless and the eternal, what lies underneath the structure of reality. He says this in the lectures on the history of uh, philosophy. Uh, philosophy uh, Parmenides changes philosophy. As we said, these early pre-Socratics were more like uh, physicists than they were philosophers. Uh, Parmenides states the problem of being. He begins this tradition, the great tradition of analysis in uh, philosophy. He's the first to analyze the data that's coming in and look at it from many different variations and angles. So the earliest progenitors of philosophy were more like physicists. Parmenides begins this great tradition of analysis. He states the problem of being. Now, that sounds highfalutin. The question of being, uh, in, in philosophy, we call it ontology. And I'll talk about that in the various fields of philosophy when we come to them. Ontos from the Greek word for being, uh, ontos, O-N-T-O-S. So what does it mean to be? Uh, simply. You know, are you the same person that you were when you were six months old, two years old, six years old? Are you the same person? In what sense are you? How do you possess being when you were two versus six versus now versus the corpse? Uh, in what sense are we existing? That's the big question. That's the question that Parmenides starts. That's kind of the essential question of uh, philosophy. Uh, he outlines what was to become known as absolute being in the history of philosophy versus conditional being. Uh, if A, then B. That's uh, the way we write um, the logical question. Um, the, it, this logically here is the question of what comes prior to everything else. If A, then B. We must know A before we can know B. That's absolute B. Conditional being is what is the condition of that? What results once we know the beginning point? Now, Heraclitus says that there is no such thing as reality itself. Everything is in a constant flux. Everything is change. So if we have uh, being itself, then we know, or at least have a better idea of what is to follow. So for Heraclitus, there is no such thing as reality itself. For Parmenides, everything is constant. There is no such thing as change. And these two people are not, we don't come to a resolution about this. Many people debate that, many people argue that we've never come to a resolution about this. Plato does offer uh, a resolve, a resolution between these two opposing positions about, um, about reality. Uh, he does so in what's called a theory of forms. Um, and we'll talk about that later. As a matter of fact, we're going to spend some time when we turn to uh, 
uh, Plato's theory of ethics about um, about the theory of forms. And I've I've said here that uh, these two forms are still a problem in modern thought um, because we don't pay attention philosophically to the fact, and I think it is a fact, that Plato and Aristotle did resolve these, uh, these differences. So um, just keep that in mind as we began to uh, develop our uh, understanding of uh, what's going on. Have I got any questions so far from you guys who are, um, are in the um, in the meeting? Okay. Now for, um, for Plato, all finite things exist in relation to other things. In other words, we have to, we have to, to be able to divide and explain different things in order to explain how they relate to each other. That's very clear. It's, it's, it should be very clear. In order to know the difference between you and me or between one person and another, we have to know personhood. So everything is sort of contingent. Uh, all finite things resist and relation exist in relation to other things. So all finite existence is conditional. Um, so we must have a beginning point. Aristotle understood that as God before we can understand the infinite laws of nature. All right. Parmenides um, was an old man when Socrates was young. Now, Socrates, remember, uh, gotta keep this straight. Socrates was the teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. And uh, in early philosophy, uh, Socrates is huge. As a matter of fact, he's, he's still huge today. We talk about the Soc uh, Socratic method of uh, teaching. Um, so, and Parmenides is gonna come into the, um, into the structure of um, modern terminology itself. Like I say, we talk about the Socratic method. We talk about Socrates as uh, the wisest teacher. Socrates is, in the early dialogues of Plato, the main actor. He structures the argument, he structures the uh, dialogue, the, uh, he structures the literature itself. And Parmenides is there oftentimes too as an opponent of Socrates. Uh, so in the early dialogues, uh, Parmenides is uh, still there. As a matter of fact, there's a famous Platonic dialogue called the uh, Parmenides. Um, uh, Parmenides was from the Greek city-state of Elia, and um, that is now the Italian city of Lacania. Um, at this time, Greek uh, Greece included many of the um, of the um, current Italian uh, states. There were uh, over, I've just noticed, noted here, you don't have to know this, but it's, I think it's a nice to know. Uh, at, at some time in history, there were over a thousand city-states in uh, ancient Greece. But the main police, uh, we get our word, by the way, um, uh, you know, when you go vote, you go to the poll, right? Well, that uh, comes from the Greek polis. Um, the, the major uh, centers, 
poluses of Greece were Athens, uh, Sparta, you guys know about Sparta, Corinthos, uh, Corinth. Uh, remember in the New Testament, uh, St. Paul has uh, uh, wrote, uh, well, actually the, there are two letters that exist. There were three letters that were rent to, uh, sent to uh, the Corinthians. There was Theba, which is Thebes, uh, Syracusa. Uh, we get our word uh, Syracuse from that Syracuse, New York. Some of you may be from uh, Syracuse. Uh, Aegina, the Aegina, Rhodos, Rhodes, Argos, Eritrea, and Ellis. Uh, each city-state ruled itself. As a matter of fact, um, this still exists in the American Constitution where each uh, state is set up as a polis. That goes all the way back to the, the, uh, the people that wrote the Constitution understood um, the way the Greeks had sort of structured themselves. So we borrowed that and the idea of the states of uh, of the United States, right? Uh, so our government is really not a heavily centralized government, it is to some degree, but mostly, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, COVID-19 has sort of shown how different uh, the states are in generating responses to the disease. There's not a dictator or a prime minister, uh, the president of the United States has limited powers to tell the governors what they must or shouldn't do. So that's kind of a organized off of that um, Greek model. Now, Zeno of Elia, remember I said Parmenides, old guy Parmenides was from Elia and that's established a kind of tradition in Elia. Uh, one of his disciples was Zeno of um, Elia, who was a great uh, Greek philosopher and mathematician. Um, Aristotle uh, calls him the inventor of dialectic. And remember dialectic is kind of a progression of how you develop an argument, how you, uh, you will use, we use dialectic in, um, in, in science. Uh, uh, the give and take of science is structured for how you develop uh, a thesis and then test that thesis. All of that's dialectic. It's a form of dialectic. Aristotle says that it is um, Zeno. That uh, there are several Greek philosophers by the name of Zeno, and we identify them for where they came from. And we're talking about Zeno of Elia here. Uh, he's 495 BC. Um, uh, that rough, roughly that time area is um, between the time that the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians in 422 and 586 when the southern kingdom uh, of Israel fell to uh, the Babylonians. So that gives you some historical perspective. He was a philosopher and mathematician. And he's famous for the invention of several logical and mathematical paradoxes um, that are still argued about uh, today. As a matter of fact, this one that we're going to discuss here, um, Aristotle tries to resolve it. He thought he resolved it. Some people not so sure. Uh, some people have argued that the, uh, the great uh, 19th century German mathematician David uh, Hilbert uh, solved this paradox. Uh, there are people that still argue, no, he didn't. It's, he didn't logically satisfy it. It's, it seems commonsensical, but there's a, sometimes a difference between common sense and mathematics, the proof of both. Um, this is what it is. You don't have to know this whole thing, but I, I think it's um, it's kind of interesting. Suppose Hermes, the fleet-footed messenger of the gods, by that that was his name. Hermes or Mercury. Some of you may remember the old Mercury uh, Ford Motor Company car. Well, Mercury is the Latin um, name of Hermes, who was the messenger of the gods. He's the fastest of all things. 
and he wishes to walk to the end of a path. Uh, before he can get there, he must get halfway there. Before he can get halfway, he must get a quarter of the way. Before traveling a quarter, he must travel one eighth. Before an eighth, one sixteenth, and so on and so on. And here we see the sort of model of gold, Mercury or Hermes there getting to where he needs to get, which is over here to number one. But he can't really ever get there mathematically. Um, sometimes uh, it's described as the problem of the tortoise and the hare, um, the rabbit, and as a matter of fact, I think Aesop, um, Aesop um, retells this as a fable uh, in which the um, the rabbit uh, challenges the tortoise to a race and he says, okay, you know, since I'm obviously a whole lot faster than you, uh, I'm going to give you a head start. I'm going to give you, let you cover three quarters of the assigned field for the race uh, before I even start. Uh, so before he goes and he gets three quarters of the way, well, uh, the rabbit, before he can get to the place that the tortoise is, he must get halfway there, before they're halfway there, halfway there, halfway there. You see, and it end up, so he never starts. Uh, that's the way uh, Parmenides and his disciple Zeno tried to prove that change was impossible that there was simply one aspect of the whole and that was all that there was there was no such thing as change change was an illusion we just think things are changing when in reality they are not now there's a difference between the common sense look at this and the mathematical look at this. And it exists as a problem today because it's difficult to solve it um, mathematically. And I'll pause this right here, or you can pause it uh, to give just a little bit of an understanding if you want to go back and uh, look at that and think about that. Again, not probably not going to be on a test, at least substantively, the thought might be, but just an interesting difference between common sense perception and logic and mathematics. But that's the point, you understand. Uh, Parmenides stresses logic and mathematics and um, the Heraclitus tradition that says there is no, nothing but change stresses the experiential tradition. And we still got this debate going on in, in science today. It's really, it's, it's inventive, I think, of the idea between um, cosmology and microphysics if any of you are interested in math and physics. It's still kind of alive uh, today in this distinction between subatomic physics and cosmology or the way the universe is uh, structured. But there's, there's something to think about. All right, let's go over, and this you do need to know here. Here are the main questions of the pre-Socratics which are still with us today. We're still trying to ask these questions and our time together over this semester is just going to be re-asking these questions that these earliest geniuses, and they were, I think, uh, of all human beings that have ever lived, they were perhaps uh, the greatest geniuses of all times. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why do we exist? Um, that's the perennial question that every thinking person asks. It's the whole reason that literature and poetry 
um, exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? And the other one stems from what we've been discussing here in the last few minutes, the problem of the one and the many. Is reality multifaceted and uh, expansive and explosive or it's simply more unified and one than that? Again, that's the big debate between Heraclitus and Parmenides. Question of appearance versus reality. Things don't often appear as they truly are. So where do we come down on the big questions of what is real versus what just seems uh, to be real. Uh, then, and this is the biggest distinction that they gave us, the, um, the problem of cause and effect. Uh, what is it that results from a cause. What is the difference between an effect of something happening and its cause? Those are the questions that they ask that don't seem to have occurred um, to any other people in their literature. And that begins the whole process of uh, science, especially physics. Well, I mean, biology too, but what is the what is the essential cause of something? And what is the effect? All of our differences in, in science and most everything else depends upon how we answer this question. Uh, the, the last question is, what does it mean to know? Is uh, truth personal? Uh, is it objective? The, the very first stab at the question of moral um, science or ethics is uh, what ought we to do um, is the problem of um, relativity. Most modern people hold some sort of relativistic um, uh, ethics. Uh, what's good for me versus the um, even my mother-in-law used to say, you ought not to criticize somebody until you walked a mile in their moccasins. Um, experience, uh, truth is relative to the person, place, and time. I always thought it was funny to, you know, walk in someone's moccasins. Uh, I don't think I own a pair of moccasins. Um, uh, the old joke, uh, you know, you ought not to criticize someone until you've walked a mile in their moccasins, and uh, then, you know, you're a mile away and you've got their shoes, so there's not much they can do about it. So anyway, I think that um, what I'm going to do is we've been at this uh, almost 45 minutes, and that's, I know it's a lot. Um, so I think before we get into the um, different fields of philosophy here, um, we're going to end uh, today. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to see is uh, if anybody um, has got any um, um, questions, I, I do have one uh, question with uh, on a, a chat question here. Uh, that um, Socrates perhaps was not a, a real person. Well, we've got pretty good evidence that, uh, that he was. Um, uh, Socrates, I mean, uh, Plato, who was his student, um, was uh, actually uh, alive, of course, at the time that, um, that Socrates was active. And, um, he mentions him not just as a subject in his dialogue as a, or an interlocutor or an arguer in his uh, dialogues, but he mentions him in his letters. And uh, then we also have um, Aristotle's, um, uh, gives a lot of examples about positions that uh, Socrates held vis-a-vis -vis or over against uh, Plato. Um, 
The theory of forms seems to have been uh, a Socratic invention that Plato toys with and argues about most of his life. Middle dialogues of Plato, Plato seems to disregard the theory of forms, although some people have argued that he doesn't, it just sort of goes underground. Um, Plato is one of the most interesting people that ever lived. He's, most of us um, are very argumentative and we see um, one thing and, and that's it. And we don't allow any, uh, anything to change us. Plato changed his mind so often. Uh, and when he, he followed the evidence, uh, he was one of the few people in history, I think, that really followed the evidence. And he might, uh, sometimes he's been, um, uh, he changes rather drastically. There's early Plato, middle Plato, uh, old Plato, and there's a whole lot of debate. I, I did my early dissertation work in, um, in, um, in Plato. And um, there's still a huge debate in the literature, just how serious these changes are. I think they're rather profound. I think they're rather distinct. He does develop over his um, existence as a as a thinker. So yeah, I I think it's pretty well commonly established, at least in um, in ancient circles, that he was a he was really real. Uh, he was an actual guy. Um, it, he never wrote anything, but it seems. Um, now the pre-Socratics wrote a lot. Um, we don't. We have merely, simply a few what are called fragments of um, the pre-Socratics. Um, Hippocrates was a, a pre-Socratic. I should mention Hippocrates uh, for most of some of you who are in um, medicine. Um, Hippocrates is um, from this uh, same time as, as uh, Thales and Anaximenes and Anaxagoras and Heraclitus and Parmenides. He's roughly from the, from the same time. Uh, we, we don't have much. I, I, f I think there are 14, 15 fragments of Hippocrates that we have left. Uh, the first, uh, of course, uh, any of you interested in medicine or nursing know the Above all, do no harm. Uh, that is uh, one of the fragments left that we know pretty clearly that um, uh, Hippocrates uh, was famous for. So we don't have books that most of these people uh, read or wrote rather, uh, although they seem to have done extensive writing. We just don't have, we don't have access to them, they're gone. Uh, a lot of this was destroyed in the, the great fire um, um, in Alexandria. Uh, so many of these documents um, were destroyed there. As a matter of fact, almost the entire works of uh, Aristotle. What we have left of Aristotle is um, the notes of his students. We, we don't have much of anything really that he actually uh, wrote, but we do have extensive notes because the students had, uh, you know, graduated from college, from the Lyceum that Aristotle uh, ran and moved into the entire Roman empire at that time. So we've got, they were finally collected into the corpus of material that now is attributed to Aristotle. And the reason um, so much of the real works of Aristotle uh, are gone is because they were so important. They were gathered into that cent cent central place because they were considered to be literally the, the way uh, Greeks thought and were to think uh, by that time. So that was the reason they were gathered into a central place and in that central place um, destroyed. So Thanks for the uh, thanks for the question. It's a great question. I appreciate that. I like all questions. By the way, I must say that um, I like people asking me questions. I remember even the bad questions, um, which leads me to everyone's famous 
statement. There are no bad questions, only questions that are stupidly not asked. So I, I don't, by the way, look, uh, I love disagreement. So if you disagree with what I say, um, I don't, you're, you're not going to um, run afoul of my grading because you disagree with me. Um, I, I, I relish uh, that and I, I relish our conversations. So don't ever hesitate to um, ask that stuff in the middle of these meetings or write it down and send it to me. Um, be glad to be glad to talk with you about that and relish that. I'm not one of the professors that punish you for disagreeing with me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't punish anybody for anything. That's not my job. But uh, in many ways, I value you more when you stand up and be counted for something. That's what's important to me. Uh, that's really what I want to teach you to do is to not be quiet the question that's but that's the reason by the way that the philosopher is the most feared thing in the world always has been always will be because they ask questions that's the reason they put socrates to death because he asked questions and power does not like questions so when somebody tries to keep you quiet They'd love to kill you if they could. So anyway, keep up the good work. Keep those questions coming. And if there's anything that I can do to help, I'm simply an email away and would be eager to do that. So any questions? We're going to close out our little time together. All right, going once, going twice. I will see you next week. And we got one or two more of these before we actually get down to the nitty gritty of reading the chapters. And as I said before, if you want to start where we're going to begin in the book, read that section on argument and paper writing and what it is that philosophy does. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a good weekend. I hope it doesn't snow where you are. Maybe I hope it does snow where you are, wherever you like. Thank you. Have a good Talk weekend. Do. Talk to you next week.